Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Well, good morning, Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries. Those of you who are here and those of you who are connected with us and are watching online, we welcome you. I wanted to mention what we are up to as Kingdom Life Church, that we have begun the peace challenge we are now on day seven and there is a journal and a chart to assess how you do every day and i think the timing for this to go through 60 days of the peace challenge practicing is how you get good at something practicing is very timely for what god is up to and if you get your journal then there's a little card with the chart for the daily rule of peace. You can put it up on your refrigerator. I don't know about you guys, but it really helps for me to have something on my refrigerator instead of just going and grabbing a book all the time. But, of course, Dennis and I have been through this so many times that we don't really need the chart anymore, but it is helpful. And so if you get your journal, be sure you get your card and also we are encouraging those of you who are doing the peace challenge if you haven't already done so to read the supernatural power of peace book and this was a story in itself because destiny image um, the acquisitions director saw the show on sid roth you can go to our website go to watch drop down the menu and go to where it says Dennis and Jen. If you click on there, you can see all the shows we've done on Sid Ross. It's Supernatural. And this was the second show that we did. So you have to scroll down to get to this. The reenactments were amazing. We thought those were the best reenactments. And so the um, editor, the acquisitions director from Destiny Image saw the show and called us, and at that time we just had the journal, and she said, that needs to be a book. We had nothing to do with Destiny Image. Destiny Image had no idea who we were until this point in time, and they said, do you want to write the book, or do you want us to write it for you? (laughs) And so the editor was a big help, but uh, to sound like you, you really need to write the book. So... I encourage you to read this. My whole idea of what peace is was changed in such an extraordinary way based on what I had seen in Dennis's life and the stories and testimonies he gave. And this book will rock your world as far as knowing what peace actually is and the power of peace on the earth when God's people walk in it. So I would encourage that and watch the show. Again, the the reenactments are fantastic. Who in here has seen the show? (laughs) But you can go onto our website under watch, go down to, it will drop down and there'll be Dennis and Jen on ISN. It's Supernatural Network, ISN, and you can watch the show. And I encourage you to do that. I think it's just the coolest show. Okay, well, today the subject has something to do with peace. And if I call the title of the message Sar Shalom, you would have no idea what that is. So I decided not to call the message Sar Shalom. It's commonly translated Prince of Peace. That is a horrible translation. Prince of Peace. 
And yet it's so popular to quote the, those verses in Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 about Prince of Peace at Christmas time and all that. And people don't even know what peace is. They think it's just tranquility or something or, you know, absence of um, chaos or something. But peace is so much more than that. And I'll start out with the, um, the story that Dennis told, that Dennis tells about when he was a young 29-year-old volunteer at a halfway house where guys were getting out of prison and they had to reintegrate into society. So they had to spend a time at this halfway house. And Dennis had noticed that before something bad went down in that place, that the atmosphere would have this negative energy in it. And so this particular day, he felt that in the atmosphere and knew that something was up. And he was standing at the kitchen, in the kitchen at this place. And for obvious reasons, they had made sure there was only one exit. You can't watch the guys all the time, you know, with multiple exits. And so this guy rushed in and grabbed a knife and threatened to cut Dennis to pieces if he didn't move from in front of the exit. And as that happened, Dennis said he felt the power of peace increase on him. Ordinarily, he would have moved. But because of the peace, he stood there. And it seemed like a long time, but he said it was actually probably seconds or minutes. And all of a sudden, there's this peace radiating from him. All of a sudden, the guy's hand started to shake. He dropped the knife, fell to his knees, and started crying. That is an example of the power of peace. So we're practicing the peace challenge, but know that that is the power of the peace that's inside you and in Ephesians, it says that Jesus himself is our peace. The enemy can't touch the fruit of the Spirit. You are protected. You are safe when you're in the fruit of the Spirit. And what's more, this peace that's in you, when you release peace out of you, you're releasing Jesus into the situation. Nothing can get past Jesus. Nothing can harm Jesus. Nothing can push Jesus around. And he is in us. Do you know everything that Jesus has and everything that Jesus is, is already in us. It's just a matter of us learning to access what he has already given us. And when we do that, we're going to see the world turned upside down, just like in the book of Acts. But we've already got it, people. It's just a matter of practicing and learning what he's deposited in us. So we're doing the peace challenge. And we just about we just talked about what peace really is. Well, you're going to learn some more in this message. But peace is powerful. That's why the book is called The Supernatural Power of Peace. And when we were talking to the cover designer, I said, I don't want it to look wimpy. Peace is not wimpy. It's power. It comes from heaven, from the throne room of, room of heaven. And it's going to flood this very place in a way we haven't imagined. But it's like the peace is going to flood in and there's going to be an explosion of power and glory. Okay, this is what we're looking forward to. And Maria was talking to me right before the... Um, right before worship, and she said that God had been speaking to her about what he is getting ready to do in this place. And I'm going to have her share what she'd gotten at home uh, during our next intercession. Okay, so now, so Jesus is Prince of Peace. It would be so much better if we just said King of Peace, because 
what do princes do? You know, they're just waiting for the king to die. You know, really. You know, they, they don't have any real function that they serve. So it would be better to say, Jesus, Sar Shalom, king of peace, and wherever there's a king, he has to have a kingdom. He has kingdom citizens. He has kingdom territory. And in that territory, he has laws for governing. He has commandments. It says, Jesus says, he who loves me will keep my commandments. A king governs. Jesus is a king with a kingdom. And lately I have been studying because we have been promised prophetically that the king of glory is going to visit this place. I've been studying the book of Matthew, which is the book of the king. And there's a reason that that is the first gospel that's presented in the New Testament. And I will not just touch on it this morning, but it's pretty astounding. I don't think that, well, in studying, there are really not very many good commentaries out there as far as I'm concerned, and I study a lot, and I get lots of commentaries and, and other study materials, but I'm going to, I hope I'm going to shift your thinking this morning just a little bit. So Jesus is a king with the kingdom. In the Gospels, what did Jesus preach? You know, there is a gospel of salvation, and that's what most churches preach, that we're forgiven for our sins. But Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Read through your New Testament. Preaching, he went everywhere, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all who came to him. I don't know how many times it's said in the gospels, but it's said a lot of times. As a matter of fact, John the Baptist came with the message, which was, repent for the kingdom has drawn near. And then in Matthew, a few verses later, Jesus went forth preaching, repent for the kingdom has drawn near. The kingdom and understanding how it works and how Jesus works through the kingdom is crucial to us understanding what Christianity is supposed to be. I'm afraid that most <coughs> churches are more like hospitals for the terminally sick instead of places equipping the disciples who will go forth and demonstrate the kingdom in society. We are called to be salt. We are called to be light. We are called to be an influence again, like the book of Acts that turns the world upside down. And that is exactly what Jesus is preparing right now. Just read the prophetic words, I mean by good prophets, that that God is not saying just go be nice people and sit in your church buildings. God is saying get up and go forth just as Jesus sent the disciples forth. But it's up to the shepherds to equip the saints for the work of the ministry so they can actually do something good. Do you know I cringe a lot of times when I see um, videos of, of people out um, preaching on sidewalks and things and I listen to what they're saying and and then I look at what there's a um, preacher over in Germany. His name is George Carl, I believe. He's been on Sid Roth a few times and he had the experience of entering into the blessed or the poor in spirit, where his soulish nature was stripped off of him, just like in Hebrews 4.12, where it's dividing asunder soul and spirit. All that junk that was cleaning, clinging to and clogging up his spirit 
was released and he was released to the throne room of God and he's lived there ever since and he's equipped his church. And do you know what his people do? They don't just go out and tell people their sins are forgiven. They go out and demonstrate by getting people healed on the streets and the people are saying, what must we do to be saved? We are supposed to be kingdom demonstrators. Okay. Now, point one is peace and God's kingdom. And so what is the definition of peace? Which is the word shalom? Shalom includes salvation, justice, and peace. In passages in the Bible, shalom is translated as health, righteousness, well-being, security, wholeness, integrity, abundance, intactness, honesty, prosperity, right relationships, protection, life-givingness, Harmony, straightforwardness, reconciliation, blamelessness, rightness, good accord. Everything there, nothing missing. Peace reveals God's kingdom. This is a, is a description, shalom is a description of what it's like in a kingdom governed by Jesus. I would say you can look around in our world today and you can see that there's a lot going on that's not governed by Jesus. First of all, a kingdom is regarded as a place governed by a king with kingdom citizens. God has a place he wants to govern. He's already governing in heaven. He doesn't need to do any more work there. We're to pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We are to be a, a window through which heaven can be poured out onto earth. So it looks like heaven. Now, when will this be fully expressed? Well, to a large extent during the millennial reign of Christ perfectly expressed in the New Jerusalem. God's kingdom, God ruling. Under the laws of the kingdom, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So a place, planet Earth, is what God's after. And he's after a people who are actually ruled by the king. We can't be very much help in bring them, bringing the kingdom to earth, God bringing the kingdom to earth through us, unless we're living under his rule, unless he's governing us. Matthew, in the book of Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7, gives the constitution of the kingdom description of kingdom citizens and then goes into how those kingdom citizens should live on earth. And it's really clear if you study Matthew that you cannot do that in your own strength. We cannot live like that. There has to be somebody else living and moving through us. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives, lives in me. So if peace reveals God's kingdom, the kingdom is where God's will is done, not our will, not people's will, not people's opinions, but where God's will is done. The entire book of Acts is a picture. It's called the, the Acts of the Apostles. It's actually the Acts of the Apostles through kingdom citizens fully surrendered to God. People through whom God, first of all, if you haven't read um, Jonathan Kahn's Return of the Kings, these were the spirits. These were the principalities and powers that were facing the, the first century and first and second century churches um, release of the kingdom. And many of them were martyred. And they did pay the price. But what they did was something that is not humanly 
possible. They went up against, in their life, in their demonstration, they went up against the strongest evil powers that have ever been on planet Earth. And as a matter of fact, because of what they did in the centuries following them, they pushed these rulers of darkness back from the from mainstream society so much so that Western civilization could be created, a new way for people to live on earth, a, a time when people could live um, without human sacrifices, like, you know, the Mayan, it's horrible what they did with the human sacrifices, a whole new way to live. The way Jesus changed the world is absolutely astounding. There's an awesome book out, it's called who is this man by uh, Ortberg, O-R-T-B-E-R-G, and it goes through exactly the change that Jesus made in the world. The funny thing is, in our day, because of the sin of man, we are now seeing the return of these ancient gods. Some of the things that we're facing, that the pride month, the evil, open evil that we're seeing, is because those Ancient evil gods have dared to come back because of the sin of mankind. Hey, God needs another kingdom people raised up. He needs them pushed back into the dry places and into the wilderness. They're holding people captive, and God loves those people, and God wants those people set free, and God is coming on the scene to make a difference. God is coming on the scene to do a kingdom work once again. And, of course, we know that in Matthew, John taught his disciples to pray. You see, in the book of, in, in the book of John, John was a, a whole different kind of book from the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of John was this wonderful spiritual book about the love of God and what we receive from Him and our oneness with God. And John came to speak life, to, to tell us what this amazing eternal life was and this amazing one that we are joined to as the Son of God. Matthew is militant. John chapter 17 is not a militant prayer. It's, it's a unity prayer. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he taught them to pray a militant prayer. And it's not something to be recited by rote the way people do in churches. I mean, it's what we are doing when we get together and pray at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings. We are joining with God in a covenant to bring his purposes to earth. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 10, your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. How is it in heaven? God's will is perfectly done. We need to be praying that God's will will be done in this region, in this nation, in the nations of the earth. And it ends with, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This is what we're praying to be released. This is what we're praying, agreeing with God. He wants this to happen in this region. This is our sphere of authority right here. But we're also praying for our nation. We're praying for Israel. We're praying for God's kingdom to come. And it's a kingdom of power and glory and his authority. No other kingdom like God's kingdom. And by the way, whenever you say kingdom, you can always substitute the word shalom for the peace of God's kingdom. As a matter of fact, in, in Romans 10, 15, Paul quoted the Old Testament and he said, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, which is the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now the kingdom exists at any person or place where God's rule is accepted as supreme. Peace comes 
when God's when God rules. We're practicing personal peace now because I'll tell you, it's got to be inward before it can be outward. You can't give something you don't have. So we need to have it in ourselves before there can be peace in the world through us. And we know of people who, well, we have encouraged you. You've got everything. You've got the love of God. You've got the peace of God inside you. We have encouraged you to go to the mall, go to the grocery store, in your place of work, in your home. You don't even have to say a word. Drop down to your spirit and release love into the atmosphere. You can set the atmosphere of your home. If there's chaos, if there's um, unpleasantness, you can drop down and you can release the peace of God. You have the power in you. Practice it. This next week, practice it. You have the power in you to change the entire atmosphere around you. Practice that during the, the peace challenge. If not every day, at least a few times a week, practice changing the atmosphere. But of course, the, the, the place where you always are, change the atmosphere for the people in your home, for your children, for your parents, for your friends, people who come over. You create the atmosphere from in you out into the world. Now, the kingdom of the hip, the king, oh, there are two terms for the kingdom for the kingdom used in the um, New Testament. One is the kingdom of God. But uniquely in the Gospel of Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is used. The kingdom of heaven. Now, what's the difference? That the kingdom of God is God's rule from eternity past to eternity future. God's rule. The kingdom of heavens is something that Jesus is uniquely emphasizing in the gospel of Matthew. The kingdom of the heavens, okay, what was about to happen now? Jesus had come. He was going to the cross. He was going to be resurrected. He was going to be ascended up into heaven, and he was going to pour the power of the kingdom out on what? on the church, on the day of Pentecost. So Jesus was getting ready to create a subset of the kingdom called the church through whom he would work on earth to release the kingdom through. The church, a subset of the kingdom. And most translations call it the kingdom of heaven. One translation calls, the, calls it the kingdom of the heavens because on the day of Pentecost, Jesus became the stairway connecting the throne room with God in heaven to the believers. He spoke about it to Nathaniel in the first chapter of Matthew. And on that letter, the angels of God ascend and descend and we know now, Tim Sheets talks about it all the time, the church partnering with the angels in prayers, commanding the angels, speaking authority. I think he must have at least five books about, about the angels and the angelic activity. And of course, he is experiencing all this and he's seen many uh, visions and, and um, sees the angels that are positioned in his church. So the angels beginning to work, the Armies of angels in heaven beginning to work with the armies of the Lord on earth in the church. What a glorious time to live. I'll tell you what, I, I know that those witnesses, the cloud of witnesses in heaven is looking down and just absolutely amazed to see what God is doing and to witness what he is getting ready to release on earth through a church who's rising up and fulfilling her purpose like the valley of dry bones that lived and stood to its feet as the army of the Lord. That is what the Lord is. You can see what God has done in Israel. He's created a nation of warriors over there. I mean, these people, you couldn't herd them into railroad cars and send them to concentration camps. 
Christians. Camps you wouldn't survive. And they are willing to fight to the death to protect their land. They're happy to. It's their God-given land. Well, whatever God is doing in Israel, He's paralleling in the church. God is creating armies on earth. His people, His kingdom citizens on earth. Now, I want to go back to the Prince of Peace. What a wimpy name. Sar Shalom. This is the militant name. And I want to read to you Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. And I'll explain more as I go. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Sar Shalom, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The zeal of the Lord who's commanding his heavenly and earthly armies will perform this. Now, the book of Isaiah uses the word shalom 27 times, which is more than any other book in the Bible. The subject of peace, shalom, begins with sar shalom, the bad translation, prince of peace, and his ever-increasing government in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, and concludes with God's promise in Isaiah 66, 12, to extend peace like a mighty river. Reminds me of the river that's flowing from the throne of God in Ezekiel, healing all that it touches. Peace like a mighty river. Now, I specifically wanted to talk about the descriptive names of Jesus used in this passage and what they actually mean. Oh, and I do want to recommend, uh, although this does not give um, the expanded Bible, I would recommend that you start using the expanded Bible. If you can find a, <clears throat> excuse me, if you can find a copy, it is the most accurate about the actual words used of any Bible, even more than the Amplified Bible that I've seen. And I am not, I am not all that interested in pretty words, but I am interested in accurate translation. I think that people who translate the Bible have a God-given obligation to translate as accurately as they possibly can. Okay, the expanded Bible. Okay, now let's talk about the names. The descriptive names of Jesus, not actual names like Jesus, but Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and most importantly, Prince of Peace. First of all, Wonderful Counselor, means the astonishing, miraculous leader who will also marvelously execute his plans. It's a single unity of miraculous plan and execution. I encourage Hebrew word studies too. Okay, mighty God, which is El Gibor. This means mighty and powerful God whose presence will change everything. This is a birth that, that Isaiah is talking about, a birth that will change everything for which there is no parallel. This is the creative power of the universe, born as a human child, given to us as a divine son. Then what does it mean, eternal father? This is not speaking of father God. Jesus came as the father of a new race of men. 
men who like him would combine humanity with divinity. And Jesus came saying that the kingdom of God is within you. Eternal Father. Jesus is not Father God, but Eternal Father in a word comp combination that anchors Jesus' actions and promises in the center of family life. God is a Father. We are His children. And He came to set the solitary in families on earth. In ancient Semitic culture, the responsibility for the welfare of the family and all those who depended on him included provision, protection, and promises like inheritance and destiny. He plays a crucial role in the continuation of the entire family line. And with God, that line goes on forever. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. So Jesus is the father of a new race of men. Okay, now, Prince of Peace. Sar Shalom. This is the only place in all scripture where this combination of sar shalom is used. Isaiah has coined a new word here. He's not speaking of an underling or subordinate like our word prince. He means the further purpose of Jesus the Messiah and that further purpose is not just about peace's tranquility or someone who has authority over peace. SAR, S-A-R, is a military term referring to the commander of all things. Prince of Peace is not enough. His authority is much bigger than that. This is the King of Glory the absolute monarch of the ages, the alpha and omega of all there is. Jesus, then, is the warlord of peace. That doesn't sound very wimpy, does it? Now, these particular verses are referred to by the angels in the what was said when the angels came to the shepherds at the birth of Jesus Luke 2:13 through 14 from the expanded bible then suddenly a very large group or great army of angels from heaven joined, appeared with the first angel, praising God and saying, give glory to God in heaven, the highest place heaven, and on earth let there be peace among the people who please God. A great militant army. And how do we, peace, how do we please God? Well, we Ultimately, we please him just by being saved and we become his child. But when we yield to him as the commander of peace and allow him to bring heaven to earth through us, we become people that God can praise. We become people who please God more than any other. The people who are working with God to extend that kingdom like a mighty river of peace on earth, the will of God being done on earth. Heaven's army was deployed to announce the birth of the king. The Sar Shalom had been born. And he is our commander. Now, what's the first time that we see Sar Shalom in action on the earth? Right at the beginning, at the time of creation. Such a wonderful description of Sar Shalom beginning 
to extend his kingdom on earth. I'll read again Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. A child will be born to us, humanity. A son will be given to us, deity. And the government will rest on his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful, Miracle Working Marvel and Awe Inspiring Counselor, One Who Plans and Executes Eternal Purposes of God, Mighty Military Hero God, Eternal Father of a New Race of Men, Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom, the one who brought peace out of chaos, and the one still in charge of peace. So at creation, we see two things. We see the Hebrew word ra, which means chaos, utter chaos, the total opposite of peace. And we see shalom. And they collide, and we see what happened. At the time of creation, Jesus, the living word, sar shalom, spoke into ra and chaos and peace came, order came, no disorder, perfect harmony, everything good, nothing bad. And listen to what Hebrews 1 through 3 in the Amplified says about this Jesus, this Shar Shalom. He is the sole expression of the glory of God the light being, the outraying or radiance of the divine, and he is the perfect imprint and very image of God's nature, upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. And if he ever stopped speaking, the universe would fly apart into chaos once again. Now, one of the words in Hebrew for describing this chaos is a, um, is a phrase, tohu bohu. When it says that the world was formless and void, it was tohu bohu. It came from Hebrew words that attempts to convey a condition that is empty, void, undistinguishable, Without purpose, without order, without meaning, a total ruin, utter and complete chaos. There's no English word that comes close to adequately capturing the concept of the phrase tohu bohu. Genesis 1, 1 through 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit. Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. I want to tell you the Spirit of God is moving over the surface of the waters in our world now. The Hebrew word that is the exact opposite of chaos is shalom. Perfect order, harmony, wholeness, and purpose. The creation testifies to the work of God. God is still in the business of bringing shalom out of chaos. It says in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Now think back to the book of Luke and the story about Jesus calming the storm. So the disciples were in the boat in the Sea of Galilee and the storm blew in and the, the waves were, were beating against the sides of the boat, and Jesus was asleep, and the disciples were absolutely terrified. So Jesus wondered, when they woke him up, wondered that they were so afraid. So Jesus simply stood in a boat that was being knocked hither and thither, and he said, Peace, the living word, the Sar Shalom spoke and said, Peace, be still. And the wind stopped and the waves calmed. 
Now, these were Hebrews. These were Jews. They knew the Torah. They knew they knew the prophets. They knew the Bible. They understood what was happening. They knew the story of creation. Luke 8, 25. Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? The living word spoke to the chaos and shalom happened. They realized that the creator God was in the boat with them. The one who has the authority to speak into the elements, to rebuke the winds and bring shalom. Again, Hebrews 1, 3 in the Amplified. This one who was in the boat with them he is the sole expression of the glory of God, the light being, the outraying or radiance of the divine, and he is the perfect imprint and very image of God's nature, upholding and main, guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. This is our Sar Shalom. This is is our God of peace. This is the one who is establishing his kingdom on earth through his people who will rise up and walk in the authority that Jesus has already given us. This is our Sar Shalom. This is the God we serve. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.